Hey everyone, I'm Victor Dwyer, and today this is the Failures and Wins podcast, where we get the latest entrepreneurs, the latest people, and we just talk about their failures, their wins, what they went through, and ways they got around it. And we're also going to dive into some Amazon marketing funnel stuff, Amazon advertising. Today I have Will. He's awesome. We, we've talked in the past all the time. And uh, we're just going to like dive right in. And uh, Will's going to tell us a little about that, how who he is, what he does. And yeah, Will, thank you so much for coming on today. Heck yeah, Victor. Thanks for having me. I'm pumped to be here and talk about a lot of my favorite topics. Business develop, Amazon marketing, a little bit of advertising. Sounds like we got a lot to cover in about an hour. Yeah, <laughs> let's do it. Yeah, tell us a little bit about yourself. Let's do it. Cool. Yeah, let's do it. So uh, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Bellavix. We are a marketplace management uh, agency and we're hyper focused on Amazon and Walmart. Uh, we've been an agency since 2018, but I have been in the space uh, since about 2008, 2009. Um, so have a lot of experience with advertising on and off of Amazon uh, and specifically some of the tactics that I've learned over time that we now apply as part of our processes here at Bellavix. Um, so really excited to be here. And like I said, excited to kind of dive deep into uh, some of these problems that I'm sure a lot of your uh, audience has in terms of like, hey, we're not hitting scale or like, what does it mean to be brand building? So uh, yeah. these are a lot of the questions we get that I'm sure a lot of people tuning in have as well. Yeah. And I love to start out with um, like the failures. Is there any particular thing that was a huge roadblock um, when it comes to building up your business, whether if it was like losing like 10 clients at one time or um, what if it was COVID, whatever it may have been, it, was there any roadblock that you had to overcome that was a big uh, impediment on your success that you kind of navigated and like how you navigated that, how you pivoted, if it was a pivot, whatever it may have been? Was there a point in your business career that that, that happened? Oh, yeah. I'm pretty sure it happens to everybody. So I'd say I'm, yeah. the, I'm no snowflake here for sure. Uh, but a specific instance for us. So, you know, coming, you know, starting your own agency and kind of going out and doing your own thing, you're pretty much a glorified consultant. Uh, and that's kind of <laughs> what I was early on. And with yeah. the, the glorified consultant also comes like, uh, you know, saying yes to everything. And, and that was a big yeah. challenge. So we came on my superpowers is advertising, specifically advertising on marketplaces. But we would do really well with these clients. And of course, logically, they're like, hey, Will crushes it on Amazon ads. Why can't he do TikTok or why can't he do Google? And early on, you're like, hey, you know, I, I got I got a family to feed. So let's let's do it. I'll take it. But, you know, it, it all in all, it's like you don't know how the system works. Uh, you don't know what good returns are. Uh, and you're doing this with clients that are expecting a certain level of results. So early yeah. on saying yes to everything actually hurt us it, it cost us in hours it was improperly priced so we weren't profitable and we just had a lot of issues so what we've learned and we've actually started to apply uh the entrepreneur operating system through gino wickman's book traction started applying some of those concepts we started working yeah. with the business coach we started building out you know what is our brand messaging what is our ideal client profile uh and then what what is our superpowers? What do we do? And then what do we say no to? So the, yeah. the biggest lesson for me is just when to say no. Um, so that I would say is the biggest learning opportunity. And we have lost clients from saying yes to too much, sinking a couple of ships and, say, and then being like, you know what? Uh, maybe you shouldn't do that anymore. Yeah. Uh, Ezra Firestone uh, said this really well about how in, in a service-based business, you always say yes, 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 yes to everything. You have to have clear guidelines to saying yes we are going to do this within this um with this within this retainer and then anything outside of that is like where you have to start talking about like increasing it and things like that and yeah. like saying no we're not going to do that on this particular thing because it can get really hard um by saying yes to everything and you have to know yeah. like saying yes i'll do that no i won't do that and it's hard yes oh um, yeah and scope creeps the problem Yep, absolutely. Scope creep's a big problem. And as you know, like, you know, we measure profitability by the amount of resources we put in a product. We have clients that wouldn't sell product for a long period of time at a loss. So we wouldn't do the same thing on the services side. Yeah, 100%.
And when it comes to like, like obviously when you are an entrepreneur and things like that, you learn a lot about yourself, um, <laughs> what you're good at and what you're bad at. For example, my weaknesses is I figured out I am a horrible communicator via text, via copy. So like if you were trying, if I was trying to email you um, to explain something, anything after two sentences looks like a sixth grader wrote it. I'll be hundred percent honest. That's it. <laughs> me but when it comes to communicating via video via words that is how i excel as a communicator so that is my like weaknesses and strengths that i found in myself is there any weaknesses that you saw when it cr comes to creating business whether it is like uh, looking at the finances or whatever it may have been um that you saw that you kind of figured out in your journey absolutely so uh so we have a lot of time so i'm just gonna list it all out here <laughs> It's a long list, guys. Trust me. Uh, I'm kidding, but you hit, you hit it. So, like, there, there's this premise that, that, you know, you should focus on your skills that are weak. Uh, and we did that for a while. Like, um, for, I'm terrible with the accounting and finances. Um, I'm fairly detailed, but I'm not a great project manager. Um, my operations team, like, on point, they're really great at systemizing things, processing things out, building standard operating procedures not my strong suit. Um, so we've learned over time is like, you should put people where they're going to excel and you should just double down on your superpower. And in my yeah. case, my superpower uh, is around, you know, marketing and advertising, doing a lot of talking like we're doing now. Um, yeah. And that's kind of where I excel. So in my role in the business owner, I really focus on the sales and marketing um, side of the business. And that's, that's, you know, that was an evolution and it took us time to get here with lots of mistakes along the way. Yeah, that's great. That's great. And going into like hiring, um, hiring has been a big area of concern right now when it comes to um, labor shortages, um, cr increased inflation. So everyone's asking for $300,000, <laughs> whatever it may be. Um, like when it comes to hiring, um, how do you hire? Is there a different way you look at it when it comes to um, looking at the person um, based off their experience? What do you have a different approach when it comes to hiring? Yeah, I think so. We use something called predictive analytics. Uh, specifically, the software we use is Culture Index. It's a veteran owned uh, organization. So always promoting our veteran organizations. Uh, but we use predictive analytics to give us an idea of who's going to excel at this. Uh, at this role. So we have enough employees that inside who work with Bellavix um, that we have their essentially their personality traits. And for example, we know somebody in a specialist role um, as a craftsman. Uh, and in terms of craftsmen, they're really good at executing and they love the art of, for example, advertising and getting into PPC. So when I'm hiring a specialist position, I'm looking for somebody who is going to be a craftsman. They're going to be really detail oriented. They may be introverted and not the best to be in front of clients, but they love the craft. They love execution and putting those people in those roles and also assigning them task rocks like these different KPIs around their strengths. Uh, we tend to get hmm. a lot better results. We also tend to have employees that stick around a lot longer because we're putting them in positions where they can succeed instead of like me early on where, you know, startup, you work, you work in every position. So when I was handling accounting, I was failing over and over again. <laughs> yeah. and now we have a bookkeeper. So I have somebody who just has that under wraps. You said something really interesting, how you give different KPIs based off different employees and what they do and their strengths. That's really fascinating. So it would be like, um, the person that's like very like introverted and developer, um, I call them developer brain type people where yeah. they like the PPC side where that's where they would have saying, Hey, like make sure you decrease a cost and things like that. But yeah. then the account manager has another set of KPIs like client retention, um, and everything else like that. So that's really fascinating because usually businesses kind of say, Hey, just like make the client happy and that's that, that's their KPI. Um, so that's really yeah. fascinating. That you and, to and absolutely, that. to be clear, we have like internal KPIs. So like a, a craftsman might be building something where his goal is to shave 25% time off of our bid optimization. So that might be an example of a task they have. The client task comes down to their KPIs. Of course, we want happy clients and 
Uh, the project manager will kind of dictate what what that might look like uh, from that threshold. But we do have, you know, we have internal KPIs and we try, like I said, to put people uh, along the lines of where their strengths are. Yeah, that's amazing. Cool, that's really neat. And then kind of diving into Amazon, um, Amazon marketing. So uh, like Prime Day was a really, really uh, big success. Um, I did a LinkedIn poll about like, um, I got like 200 votes on it, something crazy. Nice. And uh, it sounded like people usually got around a 50% um, to 100% increase on sales. But we saw a lot more than that um, with other clients. One client, they saw huge, like we saw almost like 7X, 10Xs um, on this Prime Day. So um, yeah, like it was a very successful question do you think prime day two is going to have the same level of results this close or do you think it's going to be a decreased version of that what do, what are your thoughts on prime day 2.0 well i'm an internal optimist and i've drank the amazon <laughs> anyway, so of course i think it's gonna go but all joking aside you know buyer fatigue is like it, it's a real thing and that's a concern so on top of yep. you know the prime day they have the beauty hall back to back in october then you have your Turkey five and then December is going to be just a general. It's a busy time. What's nice in 2020, they ran the prime day in October and we saw firsthand that prime day in October did not affect sales for T five, the Turkey five holiday and into December. So based on that data, based on what historical data says, I believe it's going to be, it's going to get hyped up. We're telling friends and family as they ask prime day 2.0 market on your calendar. It's coming. So I think a lot of people will get excited. And what I like about the Prime Days, it's like uh, an, it's an excuse for the normal consumer to kind of spoil themselves. Will we get a lot of holiday shopping? Probably, but I still feel like T5 and through December is when you know, a lot of us wait to the last minute. I do all my Christmas shopping like a week before Christmas starts. It kills me, you know? <laughs> if it wasn't yeah. for my wife, everybody would be getting something from the gas station as I go on my way to there. <laughs> their house oh my goodness so, so, <laughs> yeah but i mean so so i don't think we'll see buyer fatigue and i think the shop my hypothesis of course i think the shopping habits we saw in july are going to carry over in october so if i'm giving any advice to any brands that are prepping you know look at your july data look at what keywords converted make sure that you're using portfolios make sure you're putting extra budget aside and make sure you're participating in all of the different features that Amazon has, whether it's, you know, prime day deals, whether you're running coupons, access to, you know, different uh, programs like, you know, born to run or whatever else they might have going on. So, you know, we highly recommend, you know, we grow brands on marketplaces. So if they're going to host some type of holiday, we're going to have our brands participate. We're going to measure the effectiveness of this. And if it comes back, you know, we ran a bunch of lightning deals for a specific category of brands. And across the board, we noticed that, you know, they really weren't that successful. We'll learn from that. It's not like we won't participate. Maybe we'll run coupons so it's performance based and we're not forking over a bunch of uh, money to Amazon because they certainly have enough to go around. So that that's my hypothesis on, on Prime Day 2.0. And I'm excited. So we're probably kick off Christmas shopping early, but I'm, I'm probably also lying to you. Uh, <laughs> and like what's surprising is like when it comes to Black Friday, unless you're a tech product, I don't see like – Black Friday, Cyber Monday, I don't see that good of results anymore. So when I go to clients, I say like, hey, like that Black Friday budget, like let's just shift that to Prime Day because usually our Prime Days are usually three times bigger in sales than a Black Friday sale. Um, I don't know if you see something different um, like in a non-tech space, but for the most part, Black Friday is really like at least last year, Black Friday wasn't that big for us. Um, it was mostly all Prime Days. We see way, way bigger increases on Prime Days than Black Fridays usually. What about you? I I agree with that. And, you know, it's not like you shouldn't participate in T5. Yes. Like, flick your budget sure. accordingly. Like, they're in-market shoppers shopping for your product. You want to make sure you're showing up and owning page results. Like, to be clear. But, yeah, you got to think about it, too. Like, Prime Day is positioned as an Amazon holiday. What's nice sure. about Prime Day with some of the brands we work with is that generally they're really hesitant about cross-channel promotions. They're really hesitant about promoting something on their website, their email list, on their social media. But when Prime Day rolls around, you know, it's time to celebrate Amazon. So we generally are able yeah. to get a lot more push from off Amazon sources 
which I believe leads to better results. Whereas in T5, they, you know, they want people on their website, they, you know, retention marketing, capture and email addresses, better lifetime value and tracking. So like, of course, there's going to be uh, less budget, but keep in mind, Amazon has the trust. Uh, you know, they have a great uh, customer experience and people are going to, they're going to check reviews. They're going to see if they can get it faster. So like it, the, the, the shift that needs to happen is that sh uh, e-commerce shoppers are omni-channel shoppers. They're going to go to different channels. And the higher that price point is, the more research they're going to do prior to making a purchase. So you need to get in front of these people earlier and earlier. And some of the topics we might discuss today is that full funnel advertising and marketing. So like, what does it look like to attract somebody when they're just interested? Or, or if they don't even know they have the problem, how do you introduce a product so that they're like, Holy crap! I need this. I can't believe uh, you know Sham Wow. I can't believe I don't have this. <laughs> and yeah, that's what I'd call the difference between a convenience-based product and a search intent-based product. So a search intent-based product would be like um, I need a bed sheet. Like I need I need a bed sheet right now. Uh, like and like I need one for my bed. I just moved in. I need to find this right now. And then a convenience-based product might be uh, a portable battery charger. Like you yeah. don't like you, you like, it's like something, Oh wow. I didn't even know that existed. That's really cool to have. I, I would like that product and like having that w once you know, if it's a convenience based product, then from there you can deploy like DSP, some other external yes. traffic, kind of what you're saying that external yeah. marketing analysis saying, Hey, reaching out to those people and informing what their product exists, then pulling them in. So yeah, I'd love for you to dive into what that, what that full funnel marketing um looks like through like dsp amazon ads to like pull them in as a customer hell yeah and it actually like there's the organic side of it and then there's sure. the advertising side so really quick on the organic side it's like having your brand name in the title having an optimized title having leveraging all of your bullets um being aware of the mobile user which i think at this point is above 50 percent of users on amazon if i'm still correct i think feedvisors last report called that out mm -hmm. um and and uh having a plus content having a branded storefront updating it as you go so you know you yeah. have the bones there that if you're driving traffic and then on the back end too your listing attributes make sure that they're filled out correctly they will directly impact your seo amazon's updating them all the time so it's important to have that in proper catalog um alignment making sure parent children really uh products are aligned properly so like there's a lot of the infrastructure that should be in place before you're just like, you know, let's put some gas on the fire. Um, yeah. But now let's put some gas on the fire and talk about advertising. <laughs> so so, yeah. so what does that mean? So like if if you came to work for Bellavix as like a client and we get this a lot, like especially you know, if I'm tying a price point or a, a sales threshold, if you're doing about half a million dollars a year on Amazon, you're you're at a point where you're kind of ready. What we find with a lot of brands that come to us is that they're they're kind of hit that threshold they're like ah oh, yeah. we're doing half a million we've worked with a bunch of different people and we we just can't get the scale we're looking for and and nine times out of ten we find that like they're just not they're just focusing on the bottom of the funnel they're not fueling the top no prospecting going on so their pool's always limited and the pool's getting more saturated because more competitors are coming in yeah. it's becoming you know even more and more harder to have uh, and in, the, the direct to consumer is becoming more and more challenging and it, and it's noted there's um you know there's different influencers talking about it so essentially like if you come in it's important to establish the baseline so like we like to use tacos total advertising cost of sale if you don't know what that is total spend divided by total sales it gives us the ability to understand what that halo effect is amazon is one of the few platforms that will reward sales behavior so if i get a sale from off of amazon uh if i get a sale from doing anything else from adver advertising or whatever else it will improve my organic ranking because amazon knows i'm going to sell really well for these products so like you can literally train the a9 algorithm to show your products at the perfect time and of course it's not a perfect art but there's nuances you have to massage it but that's your bottom of the funnel so if you came to work with some of the, uh, an agency like Bellavix, we'd be like, okay, bottom of the funnel, we can get you 10% tacos and your cost per acquisition is this. And then it's like, well, you have 20% margin to work with. So then we know we have 10% margin to start working up that funnel in market contextual. 
And what DSP does that's great and, you know, to tie it back to Amazon's methodology, it's the better together methodology. Um, yeah. But what it does, it gives us the ability to target these customers that have shown intent on and off of Amazon and continue mm -hmm. to pepper them with ads, uh, you know, conveniently and not in a way that's too disruptive so that, but they know that, hey, I've recently looked at this product, I've looked at competitor products and to get you into that consideration phase so that you can get more sales that in the long run. So like a yep. big piece of that is of course, like uh, building out these different audiences and then slowly kind of manipulating the data so that you could start working up the funnel. And when we achieve real scale and we get the acceleration that we're looking for, it's when we're able to go top to bottom of the funnel. We're able to do lifestyle, we're able to target demographics, we're able to build affinity audiences off of your, uh, off of your website using pixels. So then we have all these tools. And if you layered even more, because I know Victor, what you do great on your end is some of that TikTok advertising and some of that social media stuff. You know, you start yeah. layering that up, working with an agency that's really capable of doing that. You know, you're, you're just funneling that top of the funnel. And like I said, drive them to your website from off, drive them wherever you want. Uh, but understand like that it's all working towards that brand equity and building that brand. And it takes time. So. Mm -hmm. When we work with brand, typically it's like a 12 to 18 month process where we're able to implement this and get incremental growth in sales. But, you know, across the board, we, you know, five, six, seven X growth within that time period because we're doing that full funnel, because they're selling a great product, because our listing infrastructure is in place and because we're driving very relevant traffic strategically to there and we're prospecting. So as seasons come around, like, Prime Day 2.0 is right around the corner. It's September. If you haven't already, you should be prospecting. You should already be like, I need to give a little margin so that I could just fill my pool up. Because I know come whenever they announce it, October you know, 12th, 13th, whatever the dates are, haven't been announced yet, totally an example. Then I know <laughs> I, I could just flip that switch. You know, Right when it goes over, we can go, okay, prospecting, prospecting, retargeting. And we just pepper them with ads and get them while they're they're intrigued by the market. They're gonna go on and look. They're gonna see your ads. They're gonna engage your ads. You're gonna get the best return on ad spend during those periods, but you had to eat it for two to four weeks as you built your prospecting pool, got people interested. And as a shopper, we do it before Prime Day. I went, I looked at everything I wanted to buy. I popped it in the mm -hmm. cart. If it wasn't running a coupon or a lightning deal, I probably didn't buy it unless I really, really wanted it. But if it was running a deal, it, it ended up in my shopping cart and it's probably in my house somewhere. <laughs> 100%. It really comes down to are you an Amazon seller or are you a brand? Like it's it's about that that that's the difference. Are you just trying to sell on Amazon and increase the sales the, the most or are you trying to really build a brand through social media and like really grow your brand recognition so when people do see you on Amazon, do see you in this full funnel analysis, they're going to pick you because you have that prominent brand. And that's what there's so many competitors now and so many Chinese uh, sellers that will undercut your price and things like that. Brand is really all there is now. Like, like Seriously. that's the reason why people buy things. And if you have like Chinese sellers will always find a way to get your, their product cheaper. So at that point you have to have a brand. If you don't, there's, yeah. there's no reason why someone's going to buy you versus a Chinese seller. If your brand sucks, like you have yeah. to have a decent brand. Whereas people say, oh, I know that per I know that brand. I know that Nike shoe. I want that one instead. And like building brand, especially in 2022, it's like it's a must, like an absolute yep. must at this point. And to be honest with you, all most of the stuff's made overseas anyway. So like the branding yeah. is what justifies a higher price point, what justifies, you know, coming in uh, and having these nuances that are a competitive advantage. So you know, Victor, I think you hit it right on the head. And, you know, what's interesting, and we don't work with resellers at all, but it seems like that 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 business model uh, is slowly phasing out. Maybe it's more of an eBay or different type of marketplace thing. But, you know, it's it appears to be getting perpetually harder uh, to be able to scale if you don't have some type of competitive advantage, if you're not building your brand. Um, and generally, you know, that's that's something the business owners have to take into account. Yeah, we work with clients all the time that do wholesale and the, that do sell to other other resellers. But 
the amount of headaches it comes with that, <laughs> like with enforcing map pricing, then you have oh, to worry God. about like the, all the buy box and then they want exclusive products. And then, yeah. then you have to worry about like, it's just a million headaches come with resellers and things like that. And it's just not worth it. It's better to own your listing. Now keep in mind, Selling on Amazon sucks. Like, let's let's get just like it sucks <laughs> to sell on Amazon. Like, there's a reason why we're in business because it sucks so much to True. sell on Amazon. <laughs> but like the 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 amount of headaches that resellers saying, "Oh, hey, we'll sell on Amazon for you, so you don't have to deal with it." That's nice, but it comes with a lot of headaches. So it's it's like it's important to have a good team behind Amazon, so you, that way you don't have to deal with it and you get all the sales benefit from it. So it, that's a little bit better way to approach it rather than being a reseller because it sucks. It really does. Yeah. So I don't, I don't recommend and, working with resellers. And you hit on that too, map pricing. Cause we work with, um, with some retail brands that are, that are in, uh, on Amazon, but also in, in brick and mortar retail. Uh, yep. and the map pricing can be a, a nightmare. And if the business doesn't have a good infrastructure, a good enforcement in place and good tracking, so what we find a lot with the resellers that we have a lot of problems with is that they sell, they have wholesale contracts and they sell it and their immediate distributors will honor those policies. But now they're wholesaling to other wholesalers and those people might care less about your brand equity, not to mention what it does to contribution. So if you have a listing that the title keeps changing, even if your brand registered title image is changing, there are people who like will, uh, do some pretty black hat things I've seen, like change the image to a completely unrelated product. But it's because if you have so many sellers, you know, 15, 16 sellers on a listing, Amazon, the algorithm's like, oh, this guy's got history, it's got what? And even though your brand registered, it'll forget. And like, we work with some of these brands, we're going in, you know, at least once a week saying, Amazon, we're the contributor, please change this back, so on and so forth. So it's almost to your point, having a, an integrated team who understands the holistic approach and what needs to happen, the brand experience for the end user so that it's consistent from your website, your social media, Walmart, Amazon, like those are all big pieces that might be missing. And, and the chime in, cause like third-party sellers is a real thing. The other side of that, what we find is when uh, larger agencies take over. So they might buy your product wholesale. And you know, this is a great model for somebody who doesn't have time to actually like go in and do the nuances. So maybe you're a startup brand. You're like, Hey, I got great website sales. I know I need to be on Amazon, but like, you know, it's me and three people and we just don't have that area. So, um, there are these, uh, I don't know if they're aggregators, wholesalers, but they will buy your product in bulk and they'll sell it. And what we find over and over again, when customers move from those types of uh, situations and, and look for in-house solutions is that, um, if it's not selling really well, if it doesn't have good brand equity, it generally it's neglected. So sure. you'll find that the listings don't have good bullets. You'll have like two images. Uh, they'll be advertising on it because it's your money. Uh, and they're, you know, you're not getting the conversion rate you need. And then you'll come to an agency and be like, yeah, I mean, I guess Amazon's good, but like, I never see sales on it. And it's like, <laughs> yeah, of course you have it. You haven't invested in it. So you're not going to yeah. see the sales. So like there, there is a purpose for all these. And, and then there's like the other side uh, where it's a really large brand and they're buying uh, an Amazon store that's already doing really well. And that's a completely different topic, but like those are the scenarios. So like to be aware of like what your options are and that third party sellers, is not always a bad thing, but to your point, Victor, it's the control of your distribution and understanding where it goes. Cause if you don't have it and it gets messy, you're gonna have to hire a legal group. You're going to have to go into the weeds and actually create these policies and then enforce them, police them and enforce them. And that itself could be a full time job. So just to oh, give yeah. some context of like some of the heartaches you might have if, if you're just willy nilly with your brand and, and letting anybody kind of pick it up and take it. Yeah, 100 percent. So we actually got a question from our audience. So the uh, audience is um, Ruben asked um, how third how third party sellers can influence the listing page. If you are authorized brand, uh, brand registry user, how would you want to answer this? Yeah. I mean, it's through the Amazon's algorithm. So to be honest with you, I don't know specifically that never sent me the a nine documentation that I've been asking so long for. So uh, I'm not <laughs> sure exactly what goes into it, but like we have 
brands that this happens to all the time. Generally, like one seller, as long as you're not competing on price, like if they're priced higher, 95, 99% of the time, it's not an issue. It's when you start getting multiple sellers that we notice consistent issues. So, you know, generally, generally more than 10, to be honest with you, but you know, you, you want no resellers. You want to own that experience. Um, so hopefully that answers it, your question, Ruben. And, and when it comes to the contribution, there, there's a point system. Um, I forgot what the exact points are, but I'll list them in order. So there's like, there's resellers, there's, uh, then there goes the, um, brand registry. Then it goes like the, like brand registry. That's the second level. And then the third level is like Amazon, uh, Amazon seller support. Um, Amazon mm. seller support can override things. And then it goes, um, Amazon, um, uh, brand registry team. And then the, the final option is the retail team. I don't even know what that means. I don't even know what a retail team is in Amazon, but <laughs> so, so they obviously have some cra crazy thing that they can change. So that's basically the levels of, so like a third party person could come on and make that change and so they can submit the change. But if anything over brand registry, brand registry, people will take over seller support can override what the brand registry person says. And then brand registry can override seller support. And then the retail team can override everyone. So that's the um, that's the the way I know how to look at it when it comes to contributions. Um, so basically, third party resellers can still technically speak to seller support and override brand registry changes. But usually, when they submit them, it doesn't get approved uh, unless they are unless they know how to speak Amazon. If they are, if they speak Amazon saying, "Hey, this will improve the customer experience if you do this," um, then then seller support will say yes and actually put it through. Um, but usually, you have to third parties aren't that smart about how to speak Amazon because <laughs> it is. I think you hit it in the yeah hit it on the head too. We just need the hierarchy uh, built out, but uh, really interesting. And on our end too, we normally skip seller support, go right to brand registry. Uh, tends to work yeah. better, but. You do have to speak the Amazon language. You hit it on the head for a better customer experience and you could call it out, you know, really almost anything with seller support. If it's a poor customer experience, it tends to get pushed to the top. So that's a really good tip uh, for anybody who's uh, in the midst of case management. And uh, hopefully it's quick and painless because it can be terrible. Yeah. And let's be honest, we're all in, we like, we all have to sub send support cases to Amazon. We yeah. all like, that's like, that's the thing that sucks the most and why like, Amazon will rant like the pesticide crisis that everyone oh, went through geez. when everyone got marked as pesticides. Like, it's just like, why, why, why do that? But then everyone had to submit cases. Then Amazon yeah. said, Hey, you have to take this course, even though yeah. like it made no sense. So everyone had to take the pesticide course. It's just like a huge headache, but like, um, it's something that we all have to deal with on not at the daily basis, definitely a weekly basis yeah. of the latest Amazon support case of the latest issue that randomly gets thrown our way. <laughs> yep. And it's always changing. It's always something new, oh, yeah. which is great. It's why we can exist and stay in business, but it's just the nuances. It's its own ecosystem. And with 50% of US e-commerce sales, you know, they could take their bowl and go home and, uh, and we would be missing out on a lot of business. True, 100%, 100%. <laughs> and um, when it comes to operations, Amazon operations, um, is there any new reports and features, whether if it's account health or whatever related that you are looking at that is insightful um, and helpful? Uh, the account health, the new dashboard. I know, uh, I don't remember off the top of my head, they removed a few inventory and different reports um, and they've come out with this new health, account health rating system and it's like green, yellow, red. Find it a lot more useful because you know before you had to be pretty technical, but now it's pretty clear and especially like, uh, when clients, they might get panicked about something and think it's a bigger deal than it is. You could still show them, hey, <laughs> we're still healthy. Things are still looking good. And then, of course, wrote like uh, the Opportunities Explorer is a great tool. Uh, they've launched some new features around the brand analytics. I love that they have uh, the full funnel uh, approach, yeah. but you can also now through the search term report kind of reverse engineer how large the market is and what your share of voice is. And you can use that to kind of figure out like, what's the opportunity for me? How big is this market an opportunity? And how much should I double down around a specific keyword? So what's been really amazing 
And Q4 every year, they roll out like hundreds of new features because they're like, sell more products on Amazon. And we're like, <laughs> yeah. yes. So, um, so like these, are be but it's becoming a lot easier. Like when we first started doing this, you know, geez, when I first started doing it, it was 10 years ago, it was hard. It was hard to measure lifetime value. It was hard to explain the concepts like full funnel and understanding lifetime value and everything else that goes into it. And Amazon's starting to give us some of these tools to be more like Google Analytics. Uh, hopefully that's not a curse word on these, uh, these <laughs> webinars. Uh, yeah. But you know, it, it gives us as advertisers, but also as executioners, the right data to tell the right story so that they understand what's going on in the account. So it's, it's mm -hmm. like a very exciting time to be in this because it's been so hard to explain some of these concepts, but now we can back it with data. We can show you what it looks like. We can show you what the opportunity is reverse engineer CPCs, we could come up with forecasts and budgets and we could say, you know, this is what we think we could do given this. And it's it's fantastic, it truly is. The, the hardest thing for people on Amazon is the reporting. Like, think yeah. about it. If you wanna get like, um, like it, everything is so scattered. Like it really is. Like finding Amazon data, like if you wanna get product sales, you have to go in another place. If you want overall account sales, you have to go in this place. And if you want to see um, lifetime, but like, I don't even think they give you lifetime. Like, like everything is so scattered around. And what it's been super helpful for me is creating an, an actionable dashboard where it's everything's in one place where you can see, oh, this is this. And like where it's not just random data points that like, because when you put too many data points on a dashboard, it's all just like you just your, your brain doesn't digest it. It's like, it's like, Oh, yeah. numbers. Cool. That's like, if you put yeah. too many numbers on an Excel sheet, no one's going to look at it. But if you make the dashboard actionable saying, okay, we spent this and got this out of it. And like, here's our lifetime value per product. Oh, let's invest more in product a instead of product B. Like then those are actionable decisions that you're making and having that actionable dashboard has been super, super helpful. So I, I am a big fan. I'm a big data nerd. So I love, love dashboards because it makes things so easy, which Amazon does not get you normally. <laughs> not yet. We built out our own dashboards too. So like hundred percent. And uh, I knew you were a data nerd. You're one of my people. <laughs> <laughs> I just like scream data nerd. Uh, like I yeah. probably just like, just you can see, oh, Victor. Yeah. He's definitely a data nerd. <laughs> we're missing the bifocals with the tape in the middle. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Awesome. Is there anything else exciting or anything, any other um, topic you wanted to cover or anything else exciting, either going into Q4 or anything else that you wanted to make sure we tackle today? Yeah. So Amazon has a new feature I am super excited about. It's called the custom, sorry, the content creators uh, network. It's in beta now and yeah. um, it's truly it's truly game changer. So like uh, on our end for a while, we've been figuring out like how to incorporate influencer marketing. And Victor, you do this way better than anyone else. But in my experience, when we were trying to build out a database, it was like herding cats. And I was uh, recently <laughs> on a call with a, a bunch of Amazon agency consultants and I had to tell them a story on how we worked through uh, a certain software uh, for a mattress company. And I sent out like a dozen mattresses to these influencers. And about half of them got the mattresses and I heard nothing from. So it ended up being really? a very expensive experiment for, uh, for Bella Vicks. Um, mm -hmm. So the fact that they have this platform with a lot of these nuances already worked out, it's directly through Amazon. What I find with uh, some of the other softwares, they still play in a gray area in terms like search, find, buy to getting, uh, using improper, what are they, two-step URLs and stuff like that. So you do have to be really careful because a lot of these yeah. platforms are designed for like the general web. The, the, you know, it's it's not against Google's terms of service as far as I know to just buy a bunch of reviews and put it on your website, but it does violate Amazon's terms of service. So, you know, my big thing is like the fact that they're baking it into the dashboard and making it really easy uh, for users to use, um, as well as like you can be confident that anything that takes place to the Amazon dashboard is gonna be within Amazon's terms of service. So you never have to worry, you know, it if this software gets flagged because maybe you weren't using it improperly, but their other users were, you know, are you going to get sunk with the rest of them as Amazon 
slowly rolls through and just kills a lot of these softwares and products. So I'm personally yeah. really excited about it. It's in beta. We are rolling. We have submitted uh, a bunch of our advertisers into the program. We're waiting to hear back. So uh, probably in the next three months, uh, hopefully by October, fingers crossed, uh, I'll have access to it and we'll be running uh, some uh, some content creators. Um, and for those of you, I, forgive me, I don't know if I explained it, what the content creation is, from what I understand, it links to TikTok. It's all the Amazon associates that are in the Amazon associate program. And you have the ability to create an order. It'd be like $5,000, 50 influencers, here's my product. And they will submit an inquiry saying like, hey, uh, I'm an influencer, I'm really interested, and um, you know, I'll buy your product. You'll, you put some stuff in like create a video, it should have X, Y, Z, make sure you talk about this do a packaging. So like it, it's like an influencer platform. You're able to do this and then you're able to accept, they'll create the content for you. They'll buy the product and then they'll, um, you'll approve the content before it goes live too. So you also get that content that you can use for, you know, your storefront, your social media, like anywhere else, not to mention it's, it's been a black box to get access to some of these Amazon associates. I know, because I built yeah. a database of Amazon Live influencers and we just scraped Amazon Live and went one by one. So the this is a game changer. This is next level for Amazon. And you could tell by the way I'm talking, I'm really excited about it. Oh yeah, like definitely. Because right now it's a very manual process. Um, it's very hard for brands to get in. And TikTok does a good job on their creative marketplace on to do this. But if it was already integrated with Amazon, it would really it would really change the game on influencer marketing and especially with all these different platforms that are utilizing like think about having an easy workflow if amazon provided that um <laughs> that would be amazing but i mean that is like super high level like that would take a lot of uh coordination on their side um uh, which would be awesome but we'll see we'll see how that goes yes <laughs> And then we have another question uh, from Ruben. Um, Hi, Will. Have you ever used any platform like Amped or Landing Cube to generate external traffic to your listing through Google Ads? Yes, uh, we use Landing Cube. Uh, it was pretty effective. Uh, I tried a couple of the softwares. This is a few years ago. Uh, so I'll tell you what we used to do and I'll tell you what we do now. Um, so Landing Cube was pretty good. It was easy to set up. Uh, it was like a plug and play platform. Um, and I liked it. We didn't have any issues. It was easy to set up ads. Um, what we do now since the brand referral program and not looking at Google shopping ads because you can't do that through Amazon, uh, we'll literally just you know set it up traditionally and link uh, the brand referral link because it gets it's a little easier. Um, and we really steer clear from doing those promo pages at this point. You know, at this point, we don't put a lot of emphasis into uh, Google or social. Uh, most of our brands usually have uh, a department that handles that. And we're hyper-focused on the DSP aspect of it. We, over and over again, we've been able to use it to show value and show growth. Um, so for us, it hasn't been uh, a service that we've really had to drill down, nor have we wanted to. And then we've had strategic partnerships with like Victor over here who does and crushes it uh, on social. So I would rather just you know, that that's your wheelhouse, you're great at it. I'm happy just yeah. to refer clients over to Victor, let him crush it, and then come back to me and say, thank you for making that recommendation because this is this is what we were looking for. Yeah, and Ruben, to uh, answer your question, um, I yeah, we use Amped all the time for Google Ads. Um, I have used Landing Queue before. Um, we progressed past that. The landing pages are kind of like scammy looking, to be honest, they look kind of sketchy. <laughs> So I, I personally didn't like them. Um, I used them for the longest time. Now I use Unbounce, which is an AI landing page oh, yeah. builder um, that basically um, basically optimizes toward the best landing page automatically. Um, so it'll like like it'll show, hey, this person's coming from Google. I'm going to show this landing page. This person's coming from Facebook. I'm going to show them this landing page. So it has some really cool AI capabilities with an Unbounce. It's a little bit more advanced. Um, and it takes a pretty um, tech savvy person to set up, but um, usually it's worth it on the landing page side. So I would recommend Unbounce rather than Landing Cube. So that's the only difference I would make there. But um, unfortunately, that's all we have time for today. Will, thank you so much for coming on. Please tell them how to find you, your website, and everything. Thank you. Yeah, well, 
Mm -hmm. Thanks for having me. This has been fun. I hope your audience took a lot of value from it. Um, my, find me on LinkedIn. You're probably watching this on LinkedIn. I post almost every day and um, I'm pretty engaged on LinkedIn. So Will Hare, uh, CEO of Bellavix. You can check out our website, bellavix.com. Uh, and feel free to shoot me uh, an email, hello at bellavix.com. And thanks again, Victor, for having me. This was a lot of fun. Yeah, thank you so much. Thanks you so much for coming on. Thank you everyone for watching. This is the Failures and Wins podcast. Thank you for coming.